Before this video begins, I would like to give a quick thank you to my Asbantium level patrons, Fallon Cortez and Nathan Gibson. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. For many years, one of the only guaranteed things about Doctor Who was its yearly Christmas special, a 12 year tradition giving us memorable moments like killer Christmas trees, robot Santas, flying sharks, and literal Santa Claus himself. By this point, Christmas and Doctor Who kind of go hand in hand, so it was a welcome return to tradition this year to see our favourite Time Lord once again return to an escapade on Christmas Day for the first time in like 6 or 7 years. This took the form of the Church on Ruby Road, where the newly regenerated 15th Doctor bursts into the life of Ruby Sunday and they go on an adventure featuring nightclubs, Davina McCall and child eating goblins. So you know, it sounds like the average Doctor Who Christmas special then. The Church on Ruby Road is meant to be a big spectacular start to a new era of Doctor Who, kickstarting a soft reboot of sorts. But is it good? Does it live up to the Doctor Who Christmas billing? Well, as always, that's what I'm here to find out. So get ready to go goblin mode because this is a deep dive into the Church on Ruby Road. Merry Christmas. As I mentioned, The Church on Ruby Road is the first episode of a brand new era of Doctor Who, and it's clear that showrunner Russell T Davis wants to replicate the success of Rose all the way back in 2005, an episode introducing the titular companion in a very punchy and relatable way, using the Doctor as more of a mysterious character landing in the middle of her life, rather than us seeing it all from his perspective. Of course, the intro narration of this episode is from the Doctor as he sets up this enigma of Ruby's parentage, but the majority of it is established by Ruby herself as she's interviewed viewed by TV celebrity Davina McCall. The stuff with Davina in this episode feels a little bit weird, but it's a good framing device, an excuse for learning so much about Ruby straight away, because you know, she's literally having to tell her life story for a TV show. Although the whole lack of appearance and therefore no emotional resolution probably means that episode got canned in the end. Indeed, the mystery of Ruby's birth is that she was abandoned as a child on the doorstep of the church on Ruby Road, hence the title of the episode and Ruby's name. It's a nice season arc to introduce, a strong mystery in the companion's past. Not only do we enjoy seeing this character become a companion, we want to learn who her parents really are and why she was abandoned. Personally, my money is still on Doctor Who pulling a red dwarf and Ruby being her own mum through sci-fi shenanigans, or at least being the one to leave her younger self at the church. It all just gives me major Ouroboros vibes. This companion-centric approach makes The Church on Ruby Road a bit of an easier jumping on point than most recent beginnings of eras. It really does try to build things from the ground up and introduce it all for the first time, although I do still feel like Rose is better for that, since this episode assumes a bit more familiarity with the Doctor and the TARDIS, so it's not as clean of a break as the production team probably hoped for. Regardless, there are some great scenes early on as Ruby Sunday bumps into the Doctor as he follows her throughout the month, fascinated by all the bad luck and coincidence swirling around her. This not only builds up the mystery of who the Doctor is and how he's able to keep watching over her like this, it also gives us that quick window into Ruby's own lifestyle, the things she does for entertainment and who her friends are. It immediately builds up a sense of familiarity with the character and what her life is like, painting that picture by showing us her nights out rather than just explaining what she gets up to and what her interests are. I think it's really effective character building which gives us good moments for both the Doctor and Ruby as individuals, like the fun scene of the Doctor being hit by a decorative snowman and having entertaining exchanges with the people around him, helping to further cement Gower in the role. Now, if you don't mind, I just got snowman and I would like to go home. In the giggle, the Doctor underwent a controversial bi-generation, splitting into both the 14th and 15th Doctors, with some level of implication that the 14th Doctor properly becomes the 15th after processing all of his trauma and fixing himself, or something. It was all pretty confusing and wasn't properly explained within the episode itself. Anyway, this allowed Shooty Gatwa's 15th Doctor to explode onto the scene full of charm, wit and confidence, essentially wiping the slate clean and giving us a Doctor free of the baggage of his predecessors. The 15th Doctor isn't some moody, edgy, lonely god like the past modern Doctors were, and we see this at the start of the church on Ruby Road as he meets his future companion in a nightclub. Health and safety, genitalic division. The Doctor's immediately a lot more carefree than the recent incarnations, and it's a nice breath of fresh air for the character, something genuinely fun and refreshing to see. I'm not a fan of the structural reboot we're getting, 
but I do appreciate how it allows us to see the Doctor like this, without the weight of the universe on his shoulders. He's able to dance and make quips without you ever feeling forced, because he's genuinely enjoying life, having rested and let go of all the trauma he'd previously gone through. Gatwa had already hit the ground running in the giggle, making such a good impression, so there's less pressure on him to make an impact in the church on Ruby Road, and that really shows. I'm the Doctor. He puts in another great performance in this episode, and he's a joy to watch. Gatwa oozes charisma and confidence, and he genuinely feels like the Doctor already, able to juggle that sense of childish playfulness and serious grit and determination in the ways we've already become so used to seeing from the main character. They are not time travellers, excuse me! Time travellers are great. Gatwa has already made the role his own and I'm so excited to see the different dimensions series 14 will introduce as the 15th Doctor now has to face bigger threats and more dramatic situations than he does in this episode. Shooter Gatwa is an absolutely fantastic Doctor already and he's very enthusiastic about the role but his new co-star Millie Gibson is just as wonderful. I even prefer Ruby's theme to the 15th Doctor's own theme. There's just something so beautiful and melancholic about her theme reflecting her origins and the emptiness she feels about not knowing her true family. I'm no music expert, but her theme is very complex and almost like a classical music piece. It's a real return to form for Murray Gold. The music in general in this episode is really strong, with a lot of tracks perfectly underlining comedic, action-packed and emotional moments throughout the story. I also just think it's really important for companions to have distinct themes to help flesh out their characters and reflect their personalities. Ruby is a really nice and sweet companion with fun energy. She very much feels like an RTD companion in the best way possible. Some companions do take a while for me to warm to, but I feel like Church on Ruby Road immediately introduces Ruby on a very strong note. She's not just a tragic backstory of a complicated family dynamic. She has all these positive traits as an individual, all the determination, sense of justice and sassiness we've come to expect of modern Doctor Who companion. So her writing feels familiar in the best way possible, helping you to immediately enjoy and root for Ruby Sunday to succeed. You actively want to follow along as she goes on this journey and sees all these wonders and terrifying villains for the first time, and that's the exact kind of first impression a new companion should make on the viewers. I learned that in the sky and you thought, yeah, I'll give that a go, babe. They've got the baby! Despite Russell T Davis reassuring us that the Doctor and Ruby's relationship will absolutely not be romantic in any way, their first meeting is very much framed as a sort of love at first sight scene, inspired by Davis's own first encounter with his husband. It's a sweet moment and the Doctor and Ruby's relationship only grows more and more entertaining throughout the episode. Their chemistry is absolutely perfect already. They bounce off each other so superbly with a lot of great jokes and humorous, sassy moments, but it's important to remind the audience that it's not all smiles and laughs, like when the episode explicitly draws the parallels between Ruby's origins as a foundling and the Doctor's own mysterious background as introduced in The Timeless Children. I'm still not a fan of the whole Timeless Child storyline, but it exists within the show now, there's no putting it back inside the box. So I'd rather it be handled and reshaped by someone as talented as Davis, who can communicate these kinds of emotional plot points a lot better than Chibnall was able to. No, I was, uh, I was abandoned. Oh, you were found in, just like Ruby. The Doctor and Ruby are both foundlings, so they both have these experiences of having a huge adoptive family and it gives them a touching sense of common existence. They can relate to each other and Ruby's human story can flesh out the Doctor's own backstory in subtle ways, without having to fully reopen the can of worms that is the Timeless Child. I just already love this Doctor companion pairing, they feel so natural together with their interactions and their outlooks on life. Like some of the best pairings in the show, the Doctor is there for all the alien know-how and confidence in the face of danger, while Ruby is there to stand up for what she believes in, you know, to ask the questions on the behalf of the audience, and to provide a sense of humanity to contrast how distant and alien the Doctor can often be. Ruby isn't some superhero with gadgets and a time machine. She's just a regular down-to-earth person, someone you can imagine going to school with or working with. And now she's thrown into all this chaos and forced to survive however she can, so you genuinely want her to succeed. I really don't like the new Sonic Screwdriver, which makes its debut in this episode. First of all, they had a perfectly good new Sonic for the 60th, so it just feels like a cynical merchandising move to introduce another one so soon. But even on a design level, I'm really not a fan of this TV remote style for it. It looks way too much like a toy or something from Power Rangers. For all 55 years of its existence, the Sonic Screwdriver has had one consistent shape, because it's meant to at least somewhat look like a screwdriver. This new one just doesn't suit that name, it feels like an entirely different Sonic device with a name 
name just slapped on there. It's an example of change for the sake of change, and yeah, I'm not a fan. I do like the random proverb inscribed on the device though, a nice meta touch that allows Shooty Gatwa to incorporate some of his own personal roots into his doctor. It translates to the sharpness of the tongue defeats the sharpness of the warrior. However, I really hate the psychic glove, the other new gadget this episode introduces. Now, I'm sure people on internet forums were up in arms in 2005 when the psychic paper was introduced, but this is a whole other level of gimmicky. This psychic glove allows the doctor to shift all his weight onto his hands so he can basically become a superhero. Hey, remember when this show was all about the doctor saving the day by using his ingenuity and intellect? Now it's just about raking in merch money. But maybe the psychic glove will be used sporadically and appropriately going forward, although Although it doesn't fill me with optimism after its introduction here. It's just Rusty Davis fixing a problem that doesn't really exist. So a big part of Church on Ruby Road is the introduction of the fantastical villains, which are literal goblins. Ew, I like them. I like goblins. Russell T Davis claimed before the episode that Doctor Who was going to start incorporating more fantasy elements, so there isn't some convenient sci-fi explanation for these goblins like there were for things like werewolves, vampires and witches in days gone by. These villains are just straight up goblins and I don't mind that. I mean come on, this is the same fictional universe with fairies and the literal devil, so a few goblins aren't exactly going to ruin the show for me. I'm a big fan of folklore and mythological monsters, so I do like these little bug-eyed menaces in this episode. Their design is admittedly pretty unique, it's not like the typical D&D or RuneScape goblins with bright green skin and long noses. Instead they have these big bug eyes and long ears, so it's distinctive and fresh for such an established folklore creature. It kind of blends together the small imp-like fairy creatures of folklore and the vicious, scavenging, pure evil Tolkien-esque goblins. So these Doctor Who goblins really do feel like their own thing and not just a cheap imitation or an awkward racial stereotype. The differences are further driven home thanks to the pirate-like clothing of the creatures. Instead of being cave-dwelling tricksters dressed in chainmail and armour, these goblins dress in relatively normal clothes and fly through the air in their giant pirate ship, which has a really great interior design with all those little lanterns and lights strung up everywhere. I just appreciate how the Church on Ruby Road tries to do something a bit new with goblins as an antagonist. Their hoarding of treasure and baby-eating ways are consistent with centuries of European folklore, but as a whole, these goblins are pretty fresh and inventive, all things considered. I do love all the moments of the goblins being tricksters, causing all this so-called bad luck for Ruby as they constantly mess with her life and create chaos. It's almost a bit Gremlins-esque, with the little monsters even almost killing Davina McCall with a Christmas tree. This bad luck is all part of tying Ruby into the timeline of the goblins or some kind of techno babble. it doesn't matter a whole much. The goblins' real plan is to eat Ruby's temporary foster sister Lulabelle, and there's a great scene of them stealing the baby, Ruby immediately earning her companion stripes by fearlessly chasing after Lulabelle and climbing up the terrifying rope ladder. Yeah, scenes like this always remind me I'd never make it as a Doctor Who companion. Jokes aside though, it's a nice way to properly unite the Doctor and Ruby, the pair reaching the ship and immediately getting captured in classic fashion. Oh yeah? <laughs> I really enjoy the character moments here, shedding light on who the Doctor is and continuing to build up his personality as this larger than life charismatic stranger. He even learns how to stroke ropes in the right way to free them, so it's a nice and quick breather before the action gets going again. I really can't complain about character moments like these, they're really important, further developing the main characters in the face of danger, seeing how they react and how they engineer their way out of trouble, it really often clues us a lot into their personalities. The Doctor and Ruby make their way through the goblin ship and it's here that the villains start doing a literal song and dance about eating babies. Yeah, I hate this. I've never been a fan of musicals, I only really like American Idiot, Herald of Darkness, that one song from Little Shop of Horrors and maybe Bugsy Malone if you catch me on a good day. I'll gladly acknowledge that musical theatre is a valid art form with quality and good performances, it's just not my cup of tea nor a medium I enjoy. Therefore when the goblin song was announced ahead of the episode coming out, it's safe to say I wasn't exactly looking forward to it. And yeah, I was right to be apprehensive. It's definitely well made and produced, but I just find it so out of place and distracting. It takes me straight out of my immersion when they start this whole song. To the episode's credit, it does try its best to keep the song within the fiction of the media itself, having it as almost this ritual or ceremony of sorts, so it doesn't feel too out of the blue. But then the Doctor and Ruby join in and it's just like, Ugh, I hate it. It just does not feel right to me. 
And look, I get it, Doctor Who isn't a stranger to musical integration, incorporating songs like Love Don't Roam and The Stowaway into previous Christmas specials. And by the way, those are absolute bangers. The Stowaway gets regular play in my Christmas playlist every year. And then there are the more explicit musical-esque performance pieces, like My Angel Put the Devil in Me and Abigail's Song, which are good songs used in appropriate contexts and they work really well, not taking you out of the fiction because they have crystal clear defined reasons for existing in their form. The Goblin Song on the other hand, just feels like it's there for the sake of having a musical moment, and I really don't vibe with it. I'm not looking forward to the fact that there's going to be more stuff like this throughout series 14. Why stop singing? Rocket Janice! The Goblin Song also serves as an introduction to the big bad Goblin King. Uh, hello, hola, yeah, I do speak a little bit of Spanish, uh, that's real by the way. Unlike the big, intimidating, hulking Goblin Kings of most media, Doctor Who's take on the character is this Jabba the Hutt, Discord mod looking blob with horrible teeth, horns, and a neck beard. Hey, at least Doctor Who fans are finally getting some representation in the show. Jokes aside, this creature does look really good, and I like that it's all practical effects rather than CGI. He genuinely seems like a bigger deal than the rest regular goblins, both literally and metaphorically, along with obviously serving as kind of like a symbol of gluttony and power, able to command all these minions to feed him without ever having to move a muscle, if he even has any left underneath all those rolls. However, as much as the Goblin King looks interesting and well realised, he doesn't really do anything, which is a huge shame. He has no real personality or identity, he's just a gaping mouth there to eat, so you don't really feel invested in the Doctor beating him and overcoming him. It's a wider issue with the Goblins as a whole, as much as I love the idea of them and their design, they do feel a bit surplus to requirements and more like a plot function rather than a fleshed out interesting villain. They build up the whole thing as the goblins feasting on coincidence, but it never really plays a huge role in the episode, so it comes across as a strange part of the villain's characterisation. The Doctor and Ruby manage to save the baby and return to Ruby's flat, where we get some really fun comedic moments of the pair trying to make excuses and bluff their way past Carla. I haven't really mentioned Ruby's family dynamic yet, but it is genuinely nice to see a Davis companion who doesn't have some bitter and abrasive mother. Ruby and Carla have a sweet and close relationship, which actually is surprisingly rare for Doctor Who companions, so it creates a cosy home life for Ruby despite her sad origins. However, the real star of the show is Cherry, Carla's stubborn mother who serves as a bit of a comedic side character in this episode. She makes a lot of funny remarks, the Doctor chats her up, and she just spends the whole time demanding a cup of tea, so I mean she only gets right at the end. So you know, thank god for that side plot. It's just fun little touches like these that breathe so much life into Doctor Who episodes and settings, giving everyone these engaging personalities rather than them just feeling like actors reading lines. However, Ruby's home life is suddenly disrupted as the goblins create a huge crack in the flat, culminating in the fantastic reveal of Ruby having never existed because the goblins travelled back in time to eat her as a baby. I absolutely adore this element of the plot. It's very similar to something like Back to the Future or the Series 5 story arc, the Doctor being the only one to remember Ruby's existence because he's a time traveller. It's a moment that really ups the stakes, especially after getting us so attached to Ruby as a person. The Doctor feels genuine in panic and sadness at her being erased. Carla and Cherry are shown to be such different people with less warm personalities, and even the colour grading of the scene is cold and blue. It all reflects the importance of Ruby to the people around her, showing how she gives so much life and joy to our adopted family. You can wonder about your parents, but I wonder who I'd be without you. There's also that fantastic callback to Vincent and the Doctor, where Amy was crying over Rory without realising because he'd been erased from time. Very similar to when Carla in the alternate timeline is also crying over Ruby despite never having adopted her. I'm not sad. Then why are you crying? Why would I want a daughter when I'm happy as I am? Then why are you crying? However, as much as I love how the timeline altering stuff adds stakes to the episodes, I really don't like the ending as the Doctor travels back to when Ruby was left on the church doorstep, just stopping the goblins by pulling the ship down and impaling the Goblin King on a church spire like Skinner in Hot Fuzz. It's so sudden and anticlimactic. There's no final showdown, the Doctor just pulls the rope and suddenly the villains are all dead. It's a very disappointing climax that highlights just how weakly characterised the goblins were, and it also feels a little bit too violent and murderous for the Doctor. Doctor. I understand he's very angry at the goblins for not only eating babies, but also erasing his fellow foundling, his new best friend, but it just kind of feels off to me for him to defeat the villains in this kind of way. I don't know, it just doesn't quite work for me. I also find it weird that the Doctor doesn't even try to call out or run after the woman who left
left Ruby at the church? Like, she's right there and maybe you can get an explanation for your brand new companion and, you know, tell her what's actually going on. Again, I, I don't know, it's weird and it feels too contrived for the narrative. There's also the big tease of Ruby's neighbour Mrs. Flood knowing what a TARDIS is, despite having not seemed to recognise it earlier. This has already led to the usual speculation of her being the Rani, Susan or the Master, etc, which always gets pretty tiring. Davis said in the Unleashed episode that this is a slow burn mystery, so it will be a while before we find out, and yeah, I just feel like he's setting up way too much stuff all at once. In four episodes we've had the teasers of the Meeps boss, the Toymaker's Legions, the One Who Waits, Ruby's Parentage, and now Mrs. Flood. It just comes across as a bit overwhelming with so many mysteries so soon. Even Moffat seemed a little bit more reserved and restrained when it came to having so many puzzle boxes. After violently murdering the Goblin King, the Doctor returns home to find Ruby safe and sound, albeit a little bit confused. It feels nice to see such a sense of joy and triumph at the end of an adventure without it feeling forced. It's clear that the Doctor has taken to Ruby and enjoys being around her, so it's a great moment as she realises he's a time traveller and races outside to see the TARDIS waiting for her. A companion entering the time machine for the first time is always seen as a big moment, a chance to revel in the fun of the TARDIS's impossible proportions, but they're a little more restrained here. Not in a bad way like the ghost monument was, but in a classy way I guess you could call it. It's not overplayed or anything like that, it just feels like a bold step for the companion as she stares in wonder. Good luck, Ruby. I like it a lot, it's a suitable way to end the episode with just those simple yet iconic words. I'm the Doctor. I think the Series 14 trailer is great, there's plenty to speculate about and dig into as we wait until May. Unfortunately, it is a longer wait than I'd hoped, but the trailer still has a lot to look forward to. I'm still not sure about the series being an onboarding point though, considering all the baggage to come. Like Kate Stewart, Mel and Rose Noble all showing up, along with god knows what villains and all those connections to the earlier specials. But it definitely looks to be a fun ride and the clip at the end of Unleashed made episode 1 seem a bit like a sci-fi survival horror story with this creepy monster, so I'm very excited about that. I think it's time to accept that most Doctor Who Christmas specials are just kind of average, a few are bad and a few are great, but the majority just end up being kind of mediocre because they're designed to appeal to the broadest possible audience and just kind of be fun that you can turn your mind off. The Church of Ruby Road is another one of those specials that's just kind of okay. It's nothing groundbreaking, it isn't some high concept masterpiece like Last Christmas, or an emotional adaptation of a Christmas classic like A Christmas Carol. It's just decent and does the job as some enjoyable, solid Doctor Who fun you don't have to think too hard about. It is also more Christmassy than some of those past specials, making more usage of the setting and theming rather than something like, say, The Runaway Bride, for example, which feels more like a normal story that just happens to take place at Christmas. Church on Ruby Road is nice in that regard, it's a perfectly serviceable Christmas special introducing the 15th Doctor and his companion in a fun and exciting story that focuses more on developing characters than having a truly great plot. Although this approach does mean the ending is really disappointing. The villains are unremarkable and paper thin, the narrative is middling and the pacing is really bad, but the chemistry of Shuti Gatwa and Millie Gibson as the Doctor and Ruby is enough to redeem the episode, with so many entertaining moments and jokes throughout the adventure. Therefore, I'd probably end up placing the Church on Ruby Road at like C tier on the specials tier list. It isn't exactly the clean slate it tries to be, but it's enough to make me feel optimistic about Series 14 and the 15th Doctor era to come. It's a decent episode of setup, and it's some solid Doctor Who for the whole family, so I can safely recommend the Church on Ruby Road. But what did you think? Was it a Christmas hit, or was it more like the aftermath of Brussels sprouts? Let me know in the comments, thank you very much for watching this whole year of Hot Over Wands videos, and as always, I'll see you next time. Happy New Year. And I'd just like to give an extra special thank you to my Asbantium level patrons, Fallon Cortez and Nathan Gibson, my Diamond level patron, Glenna Clark, my Platinum level patrons, Matthew Burns and Maximilian Foreman, and all my Gold level patrons, Boots, Daniel Shilato, Franzorn aka Line Vortex, Robert Hock, and Thomas R. Thank you so much for your support.